Please help me give a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Dr. Marion Lane, to the right of me. She is our keynote speaker for this afternoon. Our feature speaker is a, an accomplished educator. She received her master's degree from Penn State University, her doctorate from Temple University, and postdoctorate from the University of London. She has been a teacher, a principal, special education policy advisor, consultant, lecturer, program director, and is a published author. She has been a member of the DAR for 12 years. She is one of the few African-American members of the National Gable Society and serves as the Pennsylvania State President of the National Society Colonial Daughters of the 17th Century. She has served as National President of the Society of Descendants of Washington at Valley Forge 2010-2014 is and is currently a member of the board of the Museum of the African American Revolution in Philadelphia. Our speaker has dedicated the last several years to sharing her research about the contributions of our forgotten patriots. The stories of, of the men and women of African descent who served the American Revolution are not found in school textbooks. Dr. Lane was raised in Philadelphia and currently resides in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And at this moment, without further ado, I do welcome Dr. Marion T. Lane. I would like to thank Mrs. Goodwin and the administration and the students for inviting me to speak this afternoon. Uh, this is a topic that I have a great deal of interest in and you will ascertain why before the end of my talk today. Um, <clears throat> Thirteen years before the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth, Massachusetts on the Mayflower, 104 English settlers arrived at Jamestown Island in Virginia on May the 14th 1607. Jamestown was the first successful colonial settlement, and that word successful is important. Many of the original colonists were rich people who brought their indentured servants with them. Although the British were the first to establish a colony, other countries also established colonies. Now indentured servants were generally poor people who worked for someone under a contract. Initially, the contracts were written for between four to seven years. At the end of your contract, you were given what was called freedom dues. And either you were given money where you could purchase land, or you were given land as payment for your services. The colonists did not like hard labor and had a difficult time getting along with the Native Americans and therefore some of them returned to Europe. Now the first documented Africans arrived in Virginia in August of 1619. Now who were these people? Where did they come from? And how did they get there? I have, I'm going to give you some background information going to talk about the Revolutionary War, then I'm going to share some information about one of my patriots, okay? Now, at this point in time, in 1619, the kingdom, well, let me back up further than that. Um, Portugal was a world trading power. The Portuguese had um, an agreement, had been in agreement with the, the British since 1373. And um, they had been trading all over the world. They had territories. They had Brazil. They had um, a Macau that's now a part of China. They had the Azores. They had part of India. 
Um, and they had been trading in spices initially. They started trading in spices and later they traded in uh, semi-precious metals and precious metals. And also they traded in slavery. During this period of time, however, they were joined in what was called the Iberian Union. They were in, joined with Spain, okay, in what was called the Iberian Union. What did that mean? That meant all of their ships sailed two flags, the Spanish flag and the Portuguese flag. Also at this period of time in history, the Netherlands, which was a small country, the Dutch, were trying to get their independence from Spain and how they would wage war against the Spain, the Spanish, since they were such a small country, was they would hire, hire privateer ships, okay, under contract. That would be other independent ships. They would uh, get an agreement with them and they would serve under contract. And their job was to intercede anything flying a Spanish flag exchange gunfire, board the ship, and take off the bounty, all right? Uh, they were first cousins to pirates, all right, except they were under contract with a country, all right? They had a marquee from a given country, and they were flying that country's flag. So, Portugal, because they were in the Iberian Union, were feel, they were feeling very powerful. They had been trading with the Angolans for many, many years, many years. Um, the people in the Kingdom of Angola were highly skilled people. They were skilled in carpentry. They were skilled in metalworking. They were skilled in cloth. They were really skilled in farming. Okay, they were highly skilled people and the kingdom of Angola was very rich in precious and semi-precious metal, all right? So, while they were feeling powerful, the king, uh, Portugal decided, we're going, enough of this trading with Angola. We're gonna take over and make them a territory. So they invaded the kingdom of Angola. And when they did this, they took 50,000 captives when they invaded Angola because Angola said, hey, we've been trading with you all for years and you're gonna come and try to take us over? They, they resisted this. So what Portugal did after it took over and they had this, these 50,000 captives, they discovered it was too costly to feed the captives and it was too costly to guard the captives. So they decided to sell them into slavery. And there was a big ship a big frigate called the San Juan Bautista, okay? The St. John the Baptist, or the, J, the Seo Jo Bautista, okay? That's three ways of saying it, once in Portuguese, once in Spanish, once in English. They boarded up 350 of the captives and put on the San Juan Bautista, and they were headed towards Veracruz that we now call Mexico and they were gonna sell these 350 captives into slavery. Well, there were two privateer ships. They were English ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer. They were under contract flying the Dutch flag, okay? They saw the San Juan Bautista with that Spanish flag on top. So they said, okay, we're gonna take this one down. They exchanged gunfire and they boarded the Bautista. When they got on board, they were looking for silver or gold. But what they found were the 350 captives. They said, okay, they were very disappointed. Give us 60 of these captives. So they took off 60 and they headed towards Jamestown. Because they were English ships, they knew that the people in Jamestown needed help. So they headed towards James, Jamestown. When they arrived, Pocahontas' husband, John Rolfe, he recorded in 16, I believe it was 1625 when he recorded it. Um, he said some 20 and odd Africans arrived and were left, they, they came into Point Comfort. They didn't come into Jamestown, the, the, 
the ships came into Point Comfort, which is now Hampton, Virginia, and they took them over, the people over to Jamestown, all right? Um, so he recorded some 20 and odd. There were actually 32 because they were men, women, and children. There were 15 males and 17 females that arrived at Jamestown. Something you need to know, why this is very important, because next year is the 400th year anniversary of the birth of black America, when these people arrived at Jamestown Island, all right? And President Trump signed into law on January 8th a commission that will be established to teach how the people arrived, where they came from, and what happened at Jamestown, the, the authentic story of Jamestown, okay? Now, when the first Africans arrived, they were not treated as slaves. I wanna repeat that. When the first Africans arrived, and for many years, I'm sorry what your history books have taught you, they were not enslaved. They were treated as indentured servants, just like the other European indentured servants. They worked under contract for four to seven years. Later, they increased those contracts. In fact, some of the contracts wound up going for 21 years, okay? That's later in time. But initially, they worked for up to seven years, and there's a reason why they were not enslaved. They were not enslaved because they were Christian. Christianity had been introduced in the Kingdom of Angola in 1491. Also, there were three African Catholic popes. People don't, when they look at the map, map of Africa, they don't think of Christianity. And the British did not enslave Christians, okay? The Kingdom of the Congo, it was spelled with a K at that time. The map of Africa was different than it is today. The Kingdom of the Congo was a vast kingdom that bordered Angola. Afonso I, who ruled, he was king of the Kingdom of the Congo from 1508 to about 1542 or 43. He converted 80% of that vast kingdom to Catholicism. So those who came from the Congo and those who came from Angola, for sure, were not enslaved. They were treated as indentured servants. All right, it wasn't until around 1641 that the practice of owning Africans as slaves for life came to be. And it was first codified in Massachusetts and it had to work its way south, okay? It was not fully institutionalized in Virginia until 1705. The Virginia General Assembly at that time codified, fully codified, the idea of slavery, all right? With the slave laws. So just think about all that time, all right? At this time, another important caveat is the society was not based on race. The society at that time was based on class, all right? Th what did that mean? That meant that the European indentured servants, the African indentured servants, and the Native Americans socialized together. Intermarriage, okay? Intermarriage was not outlawed in Virginia until 1691. Many, many African-American families actually involved a triracial background, all right? I know in my family, when a baby is born, we never know what the baby's going to look like. We come vanilla, cinnamon, and dark chocolate brown all in the same family, okay? Because of the early mixtures, all right? Um, there is a gentleman who has done research on these families. 
His name is Paul Heinick, and this is just uh, one of his volumes of research, okay? Free African Americans of North Carolina, Virginia, and South Carolina from the colonial period to 1820. All right, he's traced my family back to 1670. And this work is online. You don't have to buy these expensive volumes, okay? You can look up your family name if you have family that came from e any of those states. He also has volumes for Maryland and Delaware, okay? Now, in 1676, African slaves, African indentured servants, and British indentured servants joined together and participated with the British in Bacon's Rebellion and also later in the French and Indian War. The colony of Massachusetts had excluded the Africans and Indians from the militia. However, by 1775, with the start of the Revolutionary War, it was now time to debate this policy. Africans by this time were referred to as Negroes. Massachusetts decided to keep its colony, its policy. However, the other colonies did not feel the same way. Many did not feel the same way because the slaves and the indentured servants had helped in the other colonial conflicts. By the fall of 1775, the debate escalated whether Negroes should be enlisted in George Washington's army. Georgia expressed fears for the safety of Georgia and South Carolina. They were afraid the British were, they were going to offer freedom to the Negroes willing to be loyal to the king and fight with the British. The delegates from Georgia also knew that the slaves had a skill of communicating amongst themselves to convey information several hundred miles in a week or a fortnight. A fortnight was two weeks. George Washington had been informed that the free Negroes in Massachusetts were very displeased at being excluded from enlistment. Fearing they might join the enemy and considering the concerns of the delegates from Georgia and others, Washington departed from the exclusion policy for his Continental Army. Now, it took him two years to decide to let these men in, all right? But eventually, as of January 1st, 1777, free men of color were permitted to join the Continental Line. Later, they permitted slaves to join also. As a result, a number of slaves and indentured servants joined the regiments. In fact, over 5,000 black men served on the Continental Line in the Revolution. Indians also enlisted. These men served in the various state militias and the Continental Army, where they were sailors, infantrymen, cavaliers, and they were called patriots. Now let me clarify, some black men also joined with the enemy. They joined with the British, the Hessians, and the Loyalists. The men um, on the Continental Line served, some served as privateers or enlisted as freedmen. A great many slaves were freed before they served and others after they served. Some slaves acted as substitutes for their masters in the regiments. From the beginning of the war, they stood side by side with the colonists using weapons and being killed and distinguishing themselves as heroes. I belong to an organization called the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. In 2008, the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution published this book. It's called Forgotten Patriots because historians have forgotten all about these patriots. African American, and Indian patriots in the Revolutionary War. So you see how thick this book is. There's a whole lot of people, okay? And um, uh, so now that, that more and more records are being digitized, we are able to access records on the men that served. Now, 
The Revolutionary War was the last integrated war until the time of the Korean War. These men stood side by side. There was no difference from one to the other, okay? Now, there were at least three black colonial units, and I don't say all black because the uh, presiding officers, the commissioned officers, were generally um, uh, British, uh, uh, British heritage, okay? Um, there was the second company of the 4th Connecticut Regiment and the Bucks of America. The Bucks of America was an all-black unit from Massachusetts under the command of Colonel George Middleton. Now, he was the only black commissioned officer that has been found to date. Um, another black, uh, all-black unit uh, traveled from Haiti with the French, the Black Brigade of St. Dominique. And there was also the first Rhode Island, okay? Now, the first Rhode Island joined Major General John Sullivan's division at Yorktown. They were among the 4,300 men who dug the first parallel of trenches on October 6, 1781, 500 yards from the enemy. They were in the trenches again on October 5, 1781, when Lord Cornwallis manned his serious readouts number 9 and number 10. The readouts were mounds of dirt. They were fortifications against the enemy, okay? And they would stick the cannons through the mounds of dirt and shoot at the enemy. While the French took readout number nine, the first Rhode Island were pushed out front because they were good, good fighters. And they took readout number 10. And readout number 10 was the last major battle of the Revolutionary War, and that was won by a black unit. We don't learn that in school, and it's sad that we don't learn that, okay? We don't learn about that first Rhode Island unit. Um, there's something else that we don't learn about in school, unfortunately, because it's not in our textbooks, and it's about um, General Bernardo de Galvez. General Galvez was the governor of Louisiana. And the reason why the Americans could win at Yorktown was because Galvez was in Florida. And he um, uh, took up the um, fight in Florida of the British ships. So they could not come up to fortify Yorktown. And he, that was the longest fight of the Revolutionary War, and nobody talks about that either. Galvez did a wonderful thing for our country in warding off those ships so that they could not come up to fortify the British at Yorktown, okay? And if you want to read an interesting story, Google General Bernardo Galvez, de Galvez. Um, all right. On the afternoon of October 19th, the British Army and, uh, 1781, the British Army and their German allies laid down their arms defeated. Yorktown was destroyed. Corpses were everywhere, including the bodies of black Hessians, black Frenchmen, black Englishmen, and black Americans. The peace treaty that officially ended the colonial rule was signed in 1783, the, the Paris Peace Treaty. The war had lasted for eight years. Now, it is with great pride that I introduce to you my patriot, my fourth great-grandfather, Sergeant Isaac Brown. Sergeant Isaac Brown was born a free black man in Charles City County, Virginia. Charles City is located 11 miles from Williamsburg. He, he was the fourth generation resident with his four bearers having been indentured servants. Isaac enlisted in the Continental Line on January 1st, 1777. He assisted in establishing American independence while acting in the capacity of sergeant at 17 years of age. He was enlisted as a sergeant. He, he 
uh, served in the 7th, 11th, and 15th Virginia regiments. Sergeant Brown served under George Washington at Valley Forge. He also served in the battles of Guilfield Courthouse, the siege of Fort 96, and Utah Springs. He received the balance of his pay for service on April 5, 1783. At least six additional members of the Brown family uh, assisted in the revolution. Abraham, one of these participants, became a property owner in Charles City six years before the revolution started with the purchase of 150 acres of land for the sum of 96 pounds. Freeman, another participant, owned 40 acres. Isaac himself owned 270 acres of land in Charles City. At the time of his death, he owned 75 acres. His land abutted right next to Greenway, the Tyler family property. Now, why is that significant? The Tyler family is the family of the 10th President of the United States, John Tyler Jr. But John Tyler Jr. was not the powerhouse in Charles City. His father was John Tyler Sr. Now let me tell you about this man. John Tyler Sr. was a wealthy landowner who served in the House of Burgess became chair of the House of Burgess, became governor of Virginia, and he was the first federal judge of Virginia. And he is the reason why we had two presidents of the United States come out of little tiny Charles City County. He was a powerful man. Give an example of what happened. The British governor, Lord Dunmore, stole the ammunition out of the magazine. What was a magazine? A magazine was a building, a huge building that they built outside of the city of Williamsburg and outside of Charles City where nobody lived just in case the, the building went up and on, caught on fire and it had all the ammunition in it, you know, it would blow up. So they didn't want the cities to blow up. So they set, built the, the magazine outside of the cities. And the magazine there was full of ammunition. Well, Lord Dunmore heard that there were stirrings about, you know, war going on. So he had his uh, men go and take all the ammunition out of the magazine. Now, Patrick Henry was from Hanover County. And John Tyler Sr. was from Charles City County. They were friends. They said, did you hear what the man did? He said, yes. And they were very upset said, you muster troops and I muster troops and we're going to march on Lord Dunmore. Well, they got their troops together and they were marching on Williamsburg. The sentries ran back and told the governor, hey, these folks are serious. They're marching up here. Lord, governor, Lord Dunmore thought about it and he said, go back and tell them I will sign a bill of lading. And that meant he was going to pay for the ammunition. So then that made John Tyler Sr. and Patrick Henry calmed down and they went back home because they got the money to buy more ammunition, all right? Now, who could have possibly made my grandfather a sergeant? It was the person in power that, of the, the um, area where they resided that mustered the troops. So it had to have been John Tyler Sr. who made this black boy a sergeant on the Continental Line. There are very few non-commissioned officers that can be identified, but, and I'll tell you later why they can't be identified, but on his muster roll and payroll sheets, it indicates at every page, sergeant, okay? Now, on May 19th, 1829, this is years later after the war ended, Sergeant Brown appeared in Superior Court in the state of Virginia under the Declaration of the Acts regarding pensions. By this time, he was 69 years of age and he had made several inquiries about getting a pension. Um, he made a formal declaration 
and his uh, request for a pension was denied. So he went back and rewrote it again, okay, asking for a pension. And again, he was denied. Now, on July 24th, 1829, Virginia Senator John Tyler, that's before John Tyler be Jr. became the president. He was the senator in Virginia. He wrote a letter on my grandfather's behalf stating that my grandfather had corrected his request for a pension and please let me know as soon as this pension is approved. Three days later, three days, the pension was approved, and my grandfather received his pension, okay? Now, why did this happen? And this happened to many of the men of color. By the time 1829 or 1830 came about, the whole mood of the country had changed, and they no longer um, honored these men of color that had served the country, okay? Now the society began to uh, be built on race rather than on class, okay? Every, all the laws had changed and everything had changed. So many, many of these men did not receive their pensions. And I, I'm blessed to have a copy of all these records because they have now been digitized and we have access to get the records, okay? The intervention of Senator Tyler resulted in the issuance of the pension. However, the compensation awarded was that of a private. They did not recognize him as a sergeant, okay? They wouldn't give him the pension as a sergeant. But if you were, if you served for more than three years, you received what was called a land bounty warrant. You, if you were a private, you received 100 acres of land. If you were a sergeant, you would have received 200 acres of land. So you received the land based on your category. And he did get his land bounty warrant. Um, now, how did I come to know this? For many, many years, my father had told me he had one grandfather that served in the Civil War and another grandfather that served in the Revolutionary War and I didn't believe him. I thought he was coming up with these stories to top my mother's family. And um, it wasn't until 2006 when I was watching a special for Black History Month by, it was being done by Dr. Henry Louis Gates out of Harvard. It was a two-day special. One day he featured Oprah Winfrey and Quincy Jones and traced their heritage back to Africa. On the second day of the special, my father and I were watching it, and by this time, my father was 86 years old, and we were watching the special, and we see our family's church, Elam Baptist Church in Charles City County, Virginia, shown on the screen, and I saw my cousin singing in the choir and everything, and I was asking, Pop, why are they showing Elam? He said, I don't know. Well, they, he was using Elam as the church that was founded by the Brown family of Charles City County, which was a free black family that dated back to colonial times. So then my father said, now we you believe it? And I said, yes. And I called a cousin who volunteered at the Charles City County History Center. And I said to her, her name is Maxine, I call her Max. I said, Max, see what records you can send me of our family around the time of the revolution. And to my amazement, what she started sending me were wills. Now these people could not read or write. But if you own land, the way you kept your land at that time was to have a will. William Tyler, John Tyler Jr.'s brother, wrote my grandfather's will, okay? So she sent me wills for all these people in my family. I was shocked. And the lady at the History Center indicated that we qualified for membership in the Daughters of the American Revolution. So I live in Bucks County, and I called the president, the, the chapter president, and I told her, I am African American, my patriot is African American, and she said, please come to our next meeting. 
We're going to have a meeting at the David Library of the American Revolution. Have you ever heard of that library? It's a fabulous library. After you get to a certain point in time, they didn't have birth, marriage, and death records, right? So you had to then look for other documents, like court documents. The way this man did this research, he looked for court documents. The free African Americans uh, could not read or write, but they knew how to use the court system. So then you go over to the court records and you can find their names in court documents because they perhaps purchased land, they paid taxes, they um, uh, uh, sold things, etc. So you can look in those documents that are registered in the courts. And that's how you begin to um, uh, do your research. Now, there are also search engines out there. Certain search engines, like I'm sure you all heard of Ancestry, but there are much better search, search records, okay? That uh, search engines that will take you overseas in records, okay? My first um, uh, African American grandfather was born in Westmoreland County in 1679. Now, his father was European. And what happened there was, this wealthy European landowner, when he came over, his wife and his son both died. And that was not unusual, because a lot of the women died in childbirth, and a lot of the young children died. So, um, he married a second time, and he married a wealthy widow. That's something that the wealthy landowners did. They would marry wealthy widows. And the reason why they married wealthy widows is because the laws were different back then. The wealthy widow could have had a whole lot of land and a whole lot of money, but whatever she owned, the minute she got married, it became her husband's. And she actually could never leave him because he could sue her for leaving with her clothes on her back, saying she stole the clothes, okay? It all became his. All right, yeah, I'm glad I didn't live back then, okay? And, but, um, so he married a wealthy widow. He had three daughters by the wealthy widow, but that posed a problem for him. He wanted a son. So he took up with a woman of color. She had to have been an indentured servant because by that time, the laws had changed, and if you had a child by a slave, the child would have been a slave. So he had to have taken up with an African indentured servant to have my grandfather. And in his will, he stipulated how my grandfather was to be indentured, one of three ways, and he assigned several of his friends to oversee my grandfather's indenture. And at the time when my grandfather turned 21, by then the indentures went till they were 21. When he turned 21, they went back to court and my grandfather received what his father left him in his will. I have a copy of the will, okay? All because you can, you know, now access these records. Um, but uh, there's a search engine that's called uh, Find My Past. And it, Find My Past operates somewhat like Ancestry, but it's better than Ancestry. And in using that, you can find records that take you overseas. I found um, that his father, um, my uh, European grandfather's father, Richard Brown, came over on the Speedwell, okay? And I got the records of who um, arrived on the Speedwell and where they arrived. And then I took the family back further and further in Europe, in Europe with Find My Past. And I was able to locate the family's coat of arms. I had that painted for my father. He now has it hanging in his living room, the family coat of arms. And this is my father's mother's line that I went uh, back up on. Um, my mother's mother's line, I've just filed an application for the Jamestown Society. I belong to 12 of these heritage organizations now. 
and um, we all, the ladies in the heritage organizations wear pins, okay? These pins represent your service to the organization. I've been an officer and all that, national officer, state officer, uh, local chapter officer, et cetera. Your offices and your donations that you make to the organization, you get pins for that. And that's the way all of these organizations work, okay? Um, the men wear medals. My father has a whole chest of medals he wears, okay? He belongs to the Sons of the Revolution and Sons of the American Revolution, Society of Descendants of Washington's Army at Valley Forge, um, and, and the, the Sons of the Civil War, okay? So that's the way all of these organizations work. Um, for my mother's, um, uh, mother's line, um, her line goes back to John Rolfe and Pocahontas. And my application came back and they were requesting for the sixth generation more documentation. And I just, my genealogist that I worked with was at my house over the weekend and we were shoring up the additional documentation. And that involves, I have DNA matches and I also um, will do an analysis for that sixth generation because what happened was John, John Rolfe and Pocahontas Hannes had one son, Thomas Rolfe. Thomas Rolfe had one daughter named Jane Rolfe and she had, um, uh, she married a Colonel Robert Bowling. Two generations up from my grandmother on my mother's side, I hit the name Bowling and I go straight back, okay? But there was one generation, um, the sixth generation, a man named Linnaeus Bowling had a, um, a relationship with a slave, Olive. And her name was Olive Bowling. And he had children by her. And one of my grandmothers was one of those children. And we're having difficulty finding documented records, but we can plot where he was living with the family. And we're gonna write that up as an analysis. Um, do any of you have any other questions? Well, I thank you for inviting me. information that was a wealth of information I'm sure that there were some things that you were very surprised about that um, you did not know because it just simply as she said before it simply is not in our textbooks um, you know how I feel about understanding culture and diversity it's a beautiful thing to understand and to be acquainted with um, your heritage and, and culture and diversity. We speak a lot about culture and diversity in the classroom. Um, again, I, I wanted to point out that um, I like the fact that she brought up the, the, the Moorish people and how they, were, they played a very important role. So, does anyone else have any questions? Give me some feedback. Tell me what you're thinking. What did what did you learn? Um, were you surprised? Have you, have you heard of the name Juan Batista? Juan Batista? Okay. Did someone say yes? Okay. We'll talk about Juan Batista and and the role that he played. So you see that the Spanish had something to do with it. Um, every every. Um, area of diversity, the Europeans, the Native Americans, and I say that respectfully, and I want you to use the, the term Native Americans and not Indians, of course, um, and the Africans, and um, all, all, all three major racial groups played a, a major role in the American Revolution, okay? No one has any questions? Okay, now listen, um, we do have, she was kind enough to bring you some books. You got three books? 
You do. How about that? These are the books that you're going to get. And um, you can take a picture with her. You can um, get these autographed so that you can keep this in your library file for future generations. And you can one day say, I met someone who is a direct descendant of the American Revolution. So I want you to go, go away with um, a reflection of how you see how you see your heritage in the American Revolution as well, because all of us, all of us can see some part of us in in this story. Okay, so I want you to go back and reflect on that. So, um, if you would like a book, okay, please um, get in the line and come and get it. <laughs> okay, come on. You want one? Okay, and you can go over and get an autograph from her. Isn't this cool?